If you would, turn your Bibles to John, the book of John, chapter 1, beginning in verse 35. John 1, 35. You know, one thing that I think about a lot is, am I, all, am I doing enough for God? Now, you might look and say, well, Chris, how, how could you think that? You know, you preach every Sunday, you know, uh, and, you know, maybe there's a couple more things you can add to that list. I don't know. But, you know, I still wonder myself, am I doing everything in my, that I'm capable of doing? And sometimes I think, well, I know that people put too much pressure on themselves thinking that they have to be highly educated in the scripture to be able to share the gospel with people. In fact, I'm going to give you an example today where I guess you could say I shared the gospel with someone and I wasn't even there. So we have to remember and that's what hopefully you can walk away with today from this lesson is that we have to remember that God is in control of all this. That God calls people to his church. Now some people don't hear the call. Now a lot of times that's the ones that we're trying to get. And so we waste our time and effort on people that have never even heard God's call. Doesn't mean they're not going to hear it in the future. Or maybe they already heard it in the past and said no to it. Look at John 1, 35-51. says, the next day John was standing, that's John the Baptist, right, was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. And I'm always, I am always amazed by that. That, you know, we look at all the things that we try to do to think about how can we share the gospel with somebody? How can we convince someone to follow Christ? And here is John the Baptist and two of his disciples see Jesus walking by and he says, and they follow him. They just let, now they were disciples of John, but when Jesus walked by, Immediately they followed him. Jesus, in verse 38, Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, Come and you will see. Now I'm always, if you, this is not uncommon for Jesus to do this. Did Jesus answer their question? No, he didn't answer their question. Because Jesus' question was, what are you seeking? And they said, you know, uh, where are you staying? They asked him another question. If you've ever bought a used car, that's a sales tactic. Don't ever answer, right? Everybody's laughing because they know it's true. You answer a question with a question. So, to me... These two disciples are not, they, they are going to follow Christ, but honestly, I feel like they don't really even know what they're doing yet. They don't have a clue. They don't want to, they don't can't, they don't want to answer his question. I mean, if, if somebody said, hey, will you follow me? And without saying anything else, you already knew that following them meant that you could lose your life. A lot of times people, when they're asked a question, they stay silent because, not because they don't know the answer, it's because they do know the answer. Verse 39, he said, Come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, it was about the tenth hour. One of the two heard John speak and followed Jesus, was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. 
he first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus, and Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. Verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Beth Bethesda, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathaniel. You see this, the trend here, right? It's kind of a chain reaction thing. Kind of the domino effect. He says, Philip found Nathaniel and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, son of the son of Joseph. And Nathaniel said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? I love that comment. And, and what's Philip's response to him? These are things that we can learn about evangelism ourselves. Does Philip, I mean, the question from Nathaniel is, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Now, I think you, you would agree that's probably sarcasm in that, right? But what does Philip do? Philip says what? He says, come and see. Now, Philip could have tried to explain everything to him about Jesus. But he didn't do that. He said, you come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, and this, I, this is funny too, and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, who in there is no deceit. So Nathanael says, What good can come out of Nazareth? And then Jesus says, Oh look, a perfect Jew. How funny, how ironic, right? But do you know, do you look at what's, what's happening here? Are these people, are these men that are giving up and turn, turning their life around and following Christ, were they highly educated? Did they know everything that was going to happen? Did they know what to say when people approached them and had questions for them about Jesus did they know exactly what to say at this point no now we know they're going to get the Holy Spirit right and the Holy Spirit's going to guide them and it's going to remind them of all truth remember that right Nathaniel said to him how do you know me Jesus answered him before Philip called you when you were under the fig tree I saw you Nathaniel answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. You like figs? No? I got a no, I got a yes, I got a yes. I'm gonna take it as a no. I can remember before I went, when I was, a, 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 you know, in grammar school, getting ready to go to school in the morning, my dad would be, I had a fig tree in the backyard. And especially if there'd been a hard rain, I mean, those figs would be like bursting open. They would be huge, you know? And we would set out, we would eat figs together, you know, right off the tree, you know. And I mean, people don't do that anymore. They're worried about, you know, uh, the FDA approved and all that stuff. I mean, we didn't worry about any of that stuff, you know. Brush it off a little bit, it's good to go. But you know, God uses fig trees a lot in the scripture. Now, I don't know if there's something, you know, holy about a fig tree or something, but. I guess they were just plentiful there. And so Jesus used the fig tree many times to uh, get, get his message across. So we look at Mark 11, 12 through 14. Mark 11, 12 through 14. On the following day when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. This is Jesus talking. And seeing in the distance of a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. 
And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, may no one ever eat the fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. So when I read that, I'm, I'm thinking, well, that's strange. So he's basically cursing the fig tree for doing something that it was created to do. Because he says that it was not the season for figs. So if you read down a few more verses, at the beginning of verse 20, he's going to explain the meaning of this parable. In verse 20 he says, As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, does not doubt in his heart, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you in your trespasses. So what is Jesus telling us with this message? And I still believe that, you know, it's very clear here that Jesus in the scripture says, okay, this is the parable I'm telling you, and now I'm going to tell you what it means. But I also look at the, the people that he was talking to and looking at, just looking at it from different angles, and, and there's some other things here that I see, uh, and you can take them or leave them, but you know, obviously the thing is that God, Jesus is saying is that have faith. That when you ask for something, and the thing is, is that people automatically tend to gravitate toward worldly things. They, they say, well, I need, I need another job. I need money. I need another car. I need another house. That if I believe, if I pray, and I really, 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 really believe that God will give me that. And I think that we all can agree that this is not about worldly things. Jesus is not talking about, uh, you know, having faith so that you can get a new car. He's talking about when people come to you and you don't know what to say to them. And this is just one example. But and you don't know what to say to them. Have faith. And let God take care of it. Say something. Say something. Do God's work means just doing something. You don't have to know it all. In that, that first passage there, it says, you know, it's not the season for figs. But yet, Christ cursed the fig tree. So, one thing that I see in that, and I see it, I question myself about it is that I can be the person that God created me to be but if, if I'm not doing something if I'm not bearing fruit whether it's in season or out of season I need to be doing something for God and if that's the case if, I, if that's not happening then there's going to be some problems in my life. I, I don't. I believe that God has a problem with that. I want to tell you a story from this week, um, and I think it fits in perfectly with this. So I have a uh, a gentleman that's a, a heavy equipment technician that lives in Jacksonville, Florida. And we've become really good friends over the last five or six years. Well, about two and a half years ago, he was diagnosed with colon cancer. And so, um, you know, it was a trying time for him, you know, and he had to have surgery. And I tell you what, to a testament to him and to his faith is that um, I don't think he missed a total of a whole week's worth of work. I mean, he had a colostomy bag and everything. I mean, he had the whole deal done. And 
still went to work every day. And I, I'm not talking about an office job either. I'm talking about working on heavy equipment. So in the early, when I found out that he had cancer, of course, I would talk to him, you know, almost every day. But when I made a trip to Jacksonville, I brought with me one of the Bible studies that we have here that I leave on the little table over there. And I talked with him a little bit, and I said, you know, make sure when you do this study, I said, you and your wife do it together. I said, you know, just take your time, you know, and make sure that you answer the question from the Scripture. Don't answer it based on what you've been taught, what you know, what you think you know. And then I prayed with him. And then we went on about our business, and he went through his treatment, and he got better, and he's doing great now. He's doing fantastic. So this past week, we met up. We had a function that we both had to attend, um, one of those dog and pony show things. Okay. So we were talking, and I, I've been struggling with some things at work and so forth. And he said, Chris, he said, you know, he said, I don't know if I could have made it without them. And it kind of shocked me because I didn't really feel like I did anything, you know. I was just, I loved the guy. I was just being humane to him and praying for him, you know, and giving him encouragement. And he says, do you remember that Bible study that you gave me? I said, yeah. He said, well, it took a while. He said, it took about five months which is a really long time for that study. But he said, we, use, we even use like five different Bibles, different versions of the Bible, because, you know, you want to be careful that it's not being set up a certain way. But then he said, he said, man, he said, that changed our life. I said, did you guys get baptized? He said, you know, we both had been baptized years ago. He said, we got And I'm going to tell you, we're standing at this thing. We were off to the side, and I started crying. And so here are these two grown men crying on each other's shoulder. I said, we better take a walk here before people start talking, you know. But I tell you that story, not, not that it's anything about me, but it's about, it's about the God's Word. If people read God's Word, it changes them. And it doesn't matter whether you're sitting there with them or not. Is, it, is that the best way I would, I would plan to do it? No. But it worked. And it made a difference in their life. And it looks like for an eternity. So that's awesome. So even though we think nothing's happened. I mean, that whole time there, I just thought... This is a dry spell, you know. I mean, you go through those, right? Where you just can't, you know, you're talking to people and there's nobody's receptive. We have to remember, I have to remember, that God's in control of this. And His Word is awesome. Because it can convince and convict people of things that I can't. In Luke chapter 13, 6 through 9. Luke 13, 6 through 9, it says, And he told this parable, A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, Look, for three years now, I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him and said, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and put on manure. And then it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if it does not, you can cut it down. So here's the question for myself and, and for you. Are you taking up space? Are you taking up ground? You know, back in Nathaniel saying, can any good come from Nazareth? Can any good come from Slide out Louisiana? Can any good come from Burlington, Mississippi? Can any good come from McNeil, Mississippi? You know, the, the owner of the vineyard said, cut it down. It's taking up space. But the vine dresser says, 
clay. Let me put some fertilizer on it. So here's the other thing. Are you, not that we want to put any manure on ourselves, but are you being fertilized? Are you reading his word? Are you understanding things today that you didn't understand 5, 10, 20 years ago? Are you just sitting there under the fig tree with no fruit to bear, just happy saying, hey, I'm, I'm a Christian. I'm in the Lord's church. But, you know, I'm not, I'm not a people person. Do you think that those disciples, as Jesus walked along the beach, that were fishermen, do you think that they were people person? They were people person. Do you think that they had all the skills, the people skills, and the knowledge and everything to, to do what Christ needed them to do, which was basically sacrifice their life for Him? God says He'll give you His Spirit, which He's given all of us. So what excuse do we have not to share that with other people? Because it's amazing, when you start to put the Word in front of people, it will change their life. Now, you're going to find people that will reject it. They're going to turn and run from it because they don't want to accept it. And it's sad, but that's okay. That doesn't mean you fail. It doesn't mean God's Word failed. It means they fail. The Great Commission, we all know it. Mark 16, 14, after he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at the table and he rebuked them for their unbelief and their hardness of heart because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. Now let's stop right there. Isn't Jesus confronting them on exactly what we've just been talking about? He's got his disciples there and he's saying that he rebuked them for their unbelief. After sitting there, right there, in front of him. He says, go into all the world, proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. Now, so, so much we always want to focus on the baptism thing there, right? And it's a, it's a valid point. I'm not saying we shouldn't. But a lot of times we, we focus so much on that one verse. It says, go into all the world, proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. We focus on that so much that we miss the part of why he was saying it. He was saying it because his people, his disciples, did not believe. Even after everything that happened, he says, he rebuked them for their unbelief and their hardness of heart. I don't want myself or you or anyone else to fall into that category. That because of my hardness of heart, that I don't share this blessing, this tremendous blessing that we've been given. I don't want to fall into that category of people that are, what, just pew-sitters, right? They're, they're excited because they come every week and they sit in the pew and they, uh, they feel real holy. They feel like they've, uh, they're doing what they, they need to do for God. They've come, they, they're taking time out of their day come worship God. That, that means something, right? What about the rest of your time here on the planet? There's going to be a lot of people that when their day comes and they stand before God, they're going to have to answer to why if, if they loved Him so much, why did they not share it? And you know, the world has taught us, once again, that 
we need to see completion, right? We need to check the boxes. We need to, okay, well, we're going to study. You're going to repent. We're going to do that. We're going to, and you're going to get baptized. We're going to do that. And you're going to come to church on Sunday. And then you're going to come to church on Sunday night. And then Wednesday, on and on, right? We want to check those boxes. I'm sorry. It just doesn't work that way. It just does not work that way. People have to, it takes time for people to accept and change their life. I mean, maybe you can't remember that in your life. I can sure remember it in mine. It took me a very long time. Now, even though I was baptized and, and God told me in His Word that if I was baptized that I received His Holy Spirit, that I was a Christian, that I was sealed with the Spirit. And I could hang on to that, but the problem is that I still had a lot of things in my life I had to learn. It took a very, and I'm still learning. I'm still changing. But don't ever think that you're not good enough to share. Because God never intended that. It's, it's a simple thing. And when, and when you start to study with somebody and you just answer some simple questions, and you start to see how their life, the way they're thinking, you, you can see it happening right in front of you. They're thinking about what they're reading. And they're, sometimes it's people that they're, they're thinking about and they're saying it. You can, you can just hear it in their head, I guess you might say. This is not what I was taught. This is not what I believe. No, this is, what, this is different than what I've been taught my whole life. And let me tell you something. When, somebody's, when you get to that point and they say... I want to be baptized. And you know, one of the things that I've always done is, I go by and say, are you sure? Do you understand what this means? You know, just recently we had a baptism here. And I think it was, it was a great example of someone that wanted, realized they needed a change in their life. And it didn't have anything to do with anybody else that was close to it. Because they said, this is between me and God. And that is so that's perfect. It's so true. It's between that person and God. Now, I witnessed another baptism, not nowhere around here, and it was a huge production. Huge production. You know, it was at this big, big church, Band, flashing lights, you know, colored lights under the water to make it all really cool looking and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Everybody, you know, it comes up out of the water, everybody's cheering. Instead, we've got somebody that we took over to a neighbor's swimming pool. And just between them and God, I said, hey, you know what? I'm going to change my life. I know we all have a lot of changes to make in our lives. I know I got plenty. And I think to a day at the last breath I take, I'm going to be, I'm still going to be doing that. We're going to be changing. But we need to pull together as a congregation, as, as brothers and sisters, and say, you know what, we're going to share the gospel with you. And I may not be smart enough, I may not, I may not. You, know, you, you can list all the excuses, right? We all do it. But I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to be like that disciple that was on the beach. And when Jesus walked by and said, follow me, I, they didn't even think twice. They got out and followed me. That's, that's the people that God wants us to be. Don't worry about all the other stuff. Get up. Let's do something. As we stand and sing.